So hey everybody, welcome back from spring break. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Um, just want to start off by thanking you for being patient and being able to adapt to a lot of different changes that are happening this semester. This is the first online lecture video that I'm making, so inevitably there are going to be some technical kinks that we have to work out. I hope that you can just bear with me through those. And in light of that, I'd like to just remind you that all of the slides that we're going off of in this lecture video are available on Canvas as always. And in addition to that, I'm going to make my own handwritten notes available. This is the stuff that I use when I go to the board to work out a problem. So hopefully if something is kind of grainy, hard to see on the video, you can always refer back to those resources on Canvas if you miss something. All right? So again, thanks for your patience with this. Um, as far as how to approach these lecture videos, what I'd like to encourage you to do is really treat this like an in-person lecture. As you watch the video, take notes and uh, try to just make this as close to the in-class experience as you can, because I'm going to try to make this as close to our in-class experience as I can. Okay? So we're going off the same lecture slides we always do. I'm going to work out examples as we always do. So hopefully the experience is as close to what we have in class as we possibly can, can get. And with that said, we're still on chapter five. We're gonna pick up right where we left off, where we started talking about friction and really laying down the concepts of static and kinetic friction, what the difference is. And since we've already laid that foundation, what we need to do is a couple more example problems just so we have this down as best we can get it, and then we'll move on to another topic, which is circular motion, okay? So let's start with the examples. Okay. This example is all about drawing free body diagrams when friction forces are involved. So in this problem, we have a stack of three equal mass books, which is resting on a flat table as shown here. So you come along and you push the middle book. You push it horizontally, just like is being shown here. But you don't push it hard enough to actually move any of the books. So what you should be thinking, since no books are moving, is static friction is involved in this process. So our job here is not to calculate anything, but just simply to draw the free body diagram of each book. So we're going to do A, B, and then C. That's the order we're going to go in with our free body diagrams, and we'll work this out on the board over here. Okay, so remember, block A is the book that's on the top of the stack, and you are not pushing block A, you're pushing the one in the middle of the stack, which is block B. So as far as block A is concerned, there are only two forces acting on it. So this is block A. So let me write that a little bigger. This is block A. And the first force we should be thinking about is gravity. There's a force that's downwards indicating the force of gravity, which we would label as WEA because this is a force that the Earth exerts on block A. That's how we denote this with our subscripts. But, of course, this block is at rest, which means there must be an upward force to cancel out that downward gravity force. And, of course, that is going to be the normal force from the block below it. In other words, the block below it, which is block B, is pushing up on block A with a normal force. So how do we denote that? That's NBA, the normal force that B exerts on block A. All right. So that's really all that's going on as far as block A is concerned. Remember, we're not pushing this block, so that's all that's happening here. When we move on to block B, we're going to see that there's some more forces that we have to account for. Now we can start with the obvious ones, which, again, let's have this little dot indicate block B. The obvious ones would be the weight so the Earth exerts a force on block B going downwards. That's gravity. And then the next thing we should probably be thinking is Newton's third law. Okay? If I have this force that B push it, pushes up on A with, I know there's going to be an equal and opposite force that uh, A pushes down on B with. That's just the third law in action. So let's draw that force going downwards. That's going to be N. A, B, and to indicate that we have an equal and opposite pair of forces, let's use the slash mark here and here. 
Okay? The next thing we should be thinking, just like before, is the block isn't moving, so in the vertical direction, in the y direction, all the forces should be balanced out. And there's going to be some kind of upward force acting on this block to balance the two downward forces out. Where is that coming from? It's coming from block C, which is at the bottom of this stack of blocks, pushing up on block B with a force that we call N, C, B. Okay. The next thing we should be thinking is, this is block B, the one in the middle of the stack. That's the one we're actually pushing with our finger. So, as indicated in the uh, slide over here, that force is going to the right. So, if we want to name this force, how about we name it P for a push force. And if we want to use our subscripts, well, it's the hand that's exerting the force. And it's block B that is experiencing the force. So we could write this as PHP if we wanted to. That would be fine. Now, notice we're not done because this block isn't moving. There is a force going to the right. It has to be balanced out by some kind of force going to the left if this block isn't going to move. And that force is what we call static friction. That's what's holding it in place. We know it has to point opposite the force of the push, just like this. And where is it coming from? This is the really tricky part of the problem. It can either be coming from block A, which rests on top of it, or block C, which rests below it. But we know there isn't a friction force from block A because we would see that on this diagram if it were there. The only place it could be coming from is block C. Okay? So we have the friction force that C exerts on B like this. And now we're done. We see the forces are all balanced out, nothing is moving, but you need that friction force from block C to explain why nothing is moving. And then finally, let's go to block C. The idea here is, again, we're going to make a free body diagram and draw all the different forces that are acting on block C. And then, as usual, we can start with gravity, because that's usually the most obvious force. The downward arrow, we'll label this WEC. And maybe the next thing we should be thinking is, on our previous diagram, we saw that C was pushing up on B with some amount of force. By Newton's third law, B is pushing down on C with an equal but opposite, in terms of direction, amount of force. Okay? So what I'm going to do is indicate that these are equal and opposite with slash marks, just like this. And then, just like before, we need a balance of the forces in the vertical direction, which means we need something going up. We need a force, which I'm going to call NTC. The table is exerting a normal force pushing up on block C, which explains why it's not moving vertically. All right. Actually, there is another force that we need to put on our diagram because it appeared on the diagram for block B. Notice how on the diagram for block B we had this force, FCB. That was the force of friction that C exerted on B. By Newton's third law, we're also going to have to have a force of friction going in the opposite direction. So now this is to the right, okay, that B exerts on C. And again, we have equal and opposite forces. Let's indicate that with slash marks. So I'll use triple slash marks for this pair. Okay? And then finally, we notice that this isn't complete because we need some kind of force going to the left to show that all the forces are balanced out and it's not moving. And where is that going to come from? Well, block C is resting on a table. That table can exert a force of friction to hold it in place. And what we can call that is FTC. So this is a really tricky example. But if you think it through, you can work out what all the forces are. And this is how it goes. So normally I'd ask you for questions. But if you have a question, leave it in our message board comment sections or email me. That's how we're going to have to do things from here on out. So back to the slides. I have one more example for you. And this is a question for the class, but 
we don't have an actual class uh, here to do the problem. So here's what I'm going to ask of you. Think about this problem, pause the video after you've read the problem and you know what it says, try to work it out, then come back to the video after a couple minutes, and then just see if you were thinking about this in the right way, okay, because we'll go over it. So in this problem, we have a picture of a rock climber who's wedged in between two vertical walls. So in rock climbing, we call this a chimney move. What we want to do here is draw a free body diagram of the rock climber. Basically, we want to understand all the different forces that are acting on the rock climber's body. That's the goal. So let's do that. So I'm going to make a little sketch of the situation here. The rock climber being wedged in between two walls. Let's see what that looks like. And basically it looks like this. We have one wall here, another wall here. And I'll try to draw the rock climber. Let's see, how's that look? Rock climber wedged between two walls. Looks good enough. I guess the rock climber should probably have some arms, so there we go. Big, big, muscly arm. All right. Um, so these two walls, we have to keep straight which one is which. So how about we call this one on the left, wall number one, this one on the right, wall number two. And of course, we can have forces from each one of these walls, depending on what's going on. So if we draw a free body diagram, again, FBD of the climber, this is what it looks like. We have a dot here indicating the climber. You want to draw all the different forces as vectors that act on the climb. That's the goal. So the first force is going to be the force of gravity, or the weight. That's always going to be present. So let's draw that, W. Now, you're probably also thinking there's got to be a normal force, or maybe more than one normal force involved in this situation. But the normal force, if it's there, is going to be coming from each of the two walls. Okay. So remember how the normal force works. Let's say we're looking at wall number one. The normal force has to be exerted perpendicular to the surface of this wall. So if wall number one is exerting a normal force on the climber, it's going straight to the right. And if wall number two is exerting a normal force on the climber, it's going straight to the left, just pushing perpendicular out from the surface. That's how these things work. Because the surfaces are, horizontal, or sorry, the surfaces are vertical, now our normal forces aren't going the way we're used to. They're going left and right. So let's draw those forces. Um, what we have here, and actually for my weight force, how about we see that, how about we say this is WBC, the weight that the earth exerts on the climber. Okay? And then for our normal force going to the right, that's exerted. Let me make this even bigger. That's exerted by wall number one. This is the normal force that wall number one exerts on the climber. I also need a normal force for wall number two, and that would be going the other way. That's the normal force that wall number two exerts on the climber. And these should be balanced out, because otherwise the climber would be moving left or right. If the climber is just stationary, wedged in that wall, that's all that should be happening. The normal force from wall one just balances out the normal force from wall two. Now, crucially, this can't be the end of the story because you need to explain why the climber isn't falling down. Okay, why isn't there a net downward force that makes the, climb, uh, the climber fall? And that's friction. Okay, so these walls can exert normal forces, which are perpendicular to the surface. They can also exert friction, which is parallel to the surface. So this would be a vertical force going up. That's friction. And we'll have two, right? There'll be a friction force from wall one. There'll be a friction force from wall two. So let's label that as the friction force that one exerts on the climber, and then the friction force that two exerts on the climber. And these have to be just enough to balance out the weight. That's how the climber can stay there and not fall down. That's how it works. So that really wraps up our discussion of friction. We're going to come back to it, of course, but we're going to move on to other topics, and some of those will incorporate these ideas of friction. So the next topic here is something called circular motion. So let's go to circular motion. All right, so 
The next section here, and we're going to be on this for quite some time, is uniform circular motion. And I'm going to start by asking you guys a question. And again, I want you to think about this question, pause the video, think about what your answer is, then come back to the video, and then I'll tell you what the correct answer is. So this says, an object is moving in a circular path at a constant speed. So just envision something like this happening, moving in a circular path at a constant speed. Is the object accelerating? Yes or no? So give that some time to think about, then come back to the video. OK, you're back. So the answer here, the correct answer is yes, the object is accelerating. Even though its speed is remaining constant, it is accelerating. And the reason for that is its velocity is changing. Whenever your velocity is changing, we have acceleration. That's why the answer is yes. Let's get into that a little bit more. So when we talk about uniform circular motion, this is the idea. Okay? Object moving in a circle at a constant speed. Okay? And I asked you guys about acceleration. So I want you to think about when is it that we know something is accelerating. Well, it's right up here. An object is accelerating when its velocity, v, is changing over time. Now think about different ways an object's velocity can be changing, right? It's basically spelled out for you right here. Now one way that we've seen and we're most used to is that the magnitude of v is changing. Okay, and the magnitude of v is just the speed of an object. So if you're speeding up or you're slowing down, there's definitely some acceleration involved in that. That's mostly what we've seen so far. But keep in mind that something else can be changing. The direction of v can be changing. Remember, v is a vector, and it points in a certain direction. So even if the magnitude is staying the same, the direction is changing, it can be accelerating. Or, to make it even more complicated, both of these things can be changing at the same time. So you can be changing direction and speeding up or slowing down all at the same time. All of these things are possible. All of these things are forms of acceleration. So what we're going to stick to here is an object moving in a circle at a constant speed. So the speed's not changing, but it is moving in a circle. And this is called uniform circular motion. So what I'm trying to convince you of here is, if you're not already convinced, is that this kind of object moving in uniform circular motion is accelerating. And the reason for that is the velocity vector is changing over time. That's why it's accelerating. So how about we draw some of those velocity vectors of this object moving in a circle, okay? So here's the first one. When the object is located at this position, the velocity is always going to be tangent to the path, so it will be pointing straight up, assuming it's rotating this way in a counterclockwise fashion, okay? But then, a moment later, the object is going to be over here, and let's ask the question, what does the velocity vector look like when the object is now over there. And the answer is, just like before, it's tangent to the path, okay? And that means the direction of this velocity vector has changed. It's not moving straight up anymore. It's moving at an angle into the second quadrant. And then we can keep going with this, and you can see how the direction of the velocity vector is constantly changing, and because of that, we must have acceleration, okay? So I think I made the point. Something moving in this way is accelerating. Now let's get a handle on exactly what does the acceleration look like. Are there some equations we can use to describe that acceleration? And here in this lecture, I'm just going to give you the equation. I'm going to give you the result. I've posted to Canvas a little lecture supplement where the derivation of this equation is given. Okay, so if you want to look at that derivation, it's under the Files tab, if you go to Other Handouts, there's a derivation of centripetal acceleration. That's this equation here. But we're not going to go over that right now. We're just going to give the result. Okay? All right. So when an object is in uniform circular motion, the first thing we need to know about its acceleration is that it points inwards, towards the center of the circle that the object is moving in. Okay? And because the acceleration always points towards the center. We call this centripetal acceleration, which is just another way of saying center C. It's, it's pointing inwards. Okay? So we know the direction of the acceleration. It's pointing in towards the center of the circle. 
We also need to think about the magnitude. How large is the acceleration? Well, it turns out it's given by this formula, which again, you can look at the derivation for this. A is equal to V squared over R. This is the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration, where V is the speed of the object, and R is the radius of the path that it's moving in. Okay? So, I really want you guys to be able to see what this looks like in an animation, because it's a bit tricky to keep straight in your head sometimes. So, what we have here is our velocity vector going tangent to the path that the object moves in, and our acceleration vector going in. Again, this is the whole idea. This vector is always pointing in towards the center of the circle. So, take a look at the animation I'm about to show you. The blue arrow always represents acceleration. The red arrow always represents velocity. And as this thing moves in a circular path, notice two things. The blue arrow indicating acceleration is always pointing in. The red arrow always indicating velocity is pointing tangent to the circle. Okay? So if you can keep all this straight, you can do pretty much any circular motion problem. Let's take one more look at that animation. There it is. Okay. So next thing. I really, really want you to get it straight that when something is moving in a circle or a curved path of some kind, it is accelerating. So to absolutely drive that point home, we're going to go back to the basic definition of acceleration that we learned about way back in chapter 3. Okay? So here we have the equation that says A, which is a vector representing acceleration, is delta V. Think of that as a change in velocity divided by delta t, some kind of change in time. All right? That's our definition of acceleration. Let's just work with that and see where it can take us. So the first thing I'm going to do is rearrange the equation to say v is equal to a times delta t. You can get there just by multiplying on both sides by delta t. Okay, so delta v is equal to a times delta t. The next thing we can do is expand out delta v, because any sort of delta is a final value minus initial. So we have v final, final velocity, minus v initial. Initial velocity equals acceleration, that vector, times delta t. And then finally, you can add the v initial term to both sides to give us v final equals v initial plus a delta t. So this is what we're going to use in what comes next. Okay. So, we're going to look at three different scenarios. The first one is this. If an object's velocity and acceleration are parallel, meaning they're pointing in the exact same direction, this corresponds to an object that is speeding up. If we look at anti-parallel velocity and acceleration, so your v vector is in the opposite direction as your a vector, then that corresponds to an object slowing down. We already have some sense of this, but let's really show it using vectors now in a vector diagram. So, so remember, this equation here says we take v initial and we add it to a times delta t. If we want to show two vectors being added together in a diagram, well, use the tip to tail method. So let's say this is our v initial vector. And then our acceleration vector is exactly parallel to it. They're in the exact same direction. This is how I would show that. The initial pointing in the exact same direction is A times delta T, and they're all in a line pointing in the same direction. When we add these two vectors together, what we get is V final. Okay? That's the addition of V initial and A delta T. It gives you V final. So let's draw that. Again, when you use the tip to tail method, you start the resultant vector at the tail of your first and you end the resultant vector at the tip of the last vector you drew. So it would just be a v final vector going all the way across the page like this. So what do we notice about this? v final has a bigger magnitude than v initial. So you're speeding up, right? You have a bigger speed at the end of the motion than at the start. That's what happens when velocity and acceleration are parallel. You're speeding up. Okay. And then if we look at the anti-parallel case, where again, my v initial and my acceleration vectors are going to be going against each other, 
rather than going together. This is what that will look like. So let's draw the initial vector like this. It's going to the right. We'll have to draw the acceleration vector going to the left. Connected tip to tail, that's what it looks like. Acceleration going to the left, connected tip to tail from our first vector. Now our resultant vector, v final, goes like this. Straight to the right, again from the start of the initial to the end of the at vector. Now what do you notice about this situation? Now our v final vector is smaller in magnitude than our v initial vector. Again, we know that corresponds to something slowing down. If the speed or the magnitude of the velocity is getting smaller and smaller, you're slowing down. Okay? So those are two cases, right? They're parallel to each other, they're anti-parallel to each other. One thing we haven't considered yet is what if they're perpendicular to each other? What if velocity and acceleration are at a right angle to one another? What does that look like? So now let's consider the case that velocity and acceleration are perpendicular. What I want to have you guys see is this corresponds to an object that's turning or changing its direction of motion. So let's start with a V initial vector. Let's just have it going to the right. Again, all that matters is I have my acceleration vector perpendicular to that. So my acceleration vector, for instance, could be going straight up like this. So there's my A times T vector. My resultant vector now is going to start here and then end over here. So that would be my V final. So notice that, again, this is an object that's turning. It's not moving in the same direction at the start of the motion as it is at the end of the motion. And that's what we see with the centripetal acceleration idea. Your velocity and your acceleration are always at a right angle. Your object is constantly turning when it's moving in a circle. That's the idea. Okay? So that's the perpendicular case. All right. So here's a question for the class. Um, just want to get us a little bit of practice using the formula for a centripetal acceleration. And uh, again, after you hear the question, pause the video, try to work it out on your own, and then we'll go through it. You're standing on the edge of a small merry-go-round, which has a radius of 1.2 meters. Your friend spins you around and gradually increases your speed. The thing is, you're going to pass out if you're accelerating too fast. Let's say you pass out if your acceleration exceeds 4.5 g's. So g here is, of course, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's what we mean by 4.5 g's. How fast are you moving? What is your speed in meters per second at the moment when you're accelerating so fast that you pass out? Okay? So again, pause the video, try to work this out, and now we'll go through it. So we'll work it out on the board here. And really, this is just a direct application of our formula for centripetal acceleration. So just to remind you what this looks like, this is the merry-go-round. This is what it looks like from the top-down sort of view. This is you standing on the edge of the merry-go-round. Okay. By the way, the radius of the merry-go-round is what we call r. And your velocity vector at any given moment is going to be tangent to this circular path that I just drew. So there's the v vector. And as we just learned, the acceleration is always going to be pointing in towards the center of the circle. So roughly speaking, that's what's going on. And v and a are always going to be perpendicular. But as far as the magnitude of this acceleration, it's just v squared over r. That's what we call centripetal acceleration. And so what we're going to do with this is solve for v. v squared is equal to a times r. In this case, what we're going to do is set the acceleration to this maximum value that you can withstand, which in the problem says is 4.5 g. So that's just directly subbed in for our acceleration, 4.5 g. And then we have the r, which was already there. If I want to solve for v and not v squared, what I need to do is take the square root on both sides. So what I'm looking for here, the speed at which I'm going to pass it out on the merry-go-round, is square root 4.5, g is 9.8 meters per second squared, and then the radius, what did I say the radius was? 1.2 meters. Okay. 
And if you crunch these numbers, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get 7.3 meters per second. So just to reiterate, that's how fast you're moving in this circular path if your acceleration is 4.5 g's. That's the idea. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on to something else here. Related to circular motion is something called period and another related concept called frequency. So really all we have here with period and frequency is another way of describing how fast you're moving as you move in a circular path. So let's get comfortable with these ideas before we launch into the examples. Let's start with period, okay? The period, and we give the variable capital T for period, that's how long it takes a rotating object, something moving in a circle, to complete one full revolution. That's how long it takes to go in a circle one full time. And how could we figure out what the period is? Well, think of it this way. For the period, you know what the distance is going to be. You know that in one period, that's one full circle, the distance you move is equal to the circumference of this circle. That's just the distance around the circle one full time. So if we use the idea that the speed at which you move is the distance that you travel divided by the time, we can write in uh, what's said in words here as an equation, v, that's your speed, is equal to the distance, which is going to be 2 pi r, that's the circumference of the circle, and then the time it takes is capital T, that's the period. So we can use this idea right here to get the period if we know other things like the radius of the path and the speed that you're moving. And related to the idea of period, which is again how long it takes to go in a circle one full time, is frequency. The definition of frequency is the number of full revolutions that an object makes per unit of time. So for instance, I could be spinning around at 10 RPM. What does that mean? It means I make 10 revolutions per minute. That's just one example of frequency. And it's really easy to see how to calculate frequency, which is F by the way, if we have the period T. Because let me go to the board here for just one second. If we think about the period, t, as being the time it takes to make a rotation, the frequency is how many rotations I make per unit of time. And when you write it this way, it's pretty clear that frequency is just the inverse of the period, and vice versa. If I wanted the period, that would be the inverse of the frequency. Because one is time per rotation, the other is rotations per time. They're just the inverse of each other. Okay? So that's why the formula given on the slide here is frequency, F, is 1 over T, 1 over period. Now, for period, it's, a, it's an amount of time, so seconds would be an appropriate unit for that. When it comes to frequency, we have a different type of unit that we have to think about. So, there are a couple that I'm going to give you here. One is revolutions per minute. So how many full rotations does the object make every minute? We also have revolutions per second. How many full rotations does it make every second? I just want to point out that RPM is commonly denoted, or revolutions per minute is commonly denoted as RPM. But revolutions per second is actually denoted like this, and this is called Hertz. So revolutions per second is equivalent to hertz as a unit for frequency, okay? So I just threw a lot at you, so we're going to go through some examples to clarify these ideas. And uh, here's the first one that we're going to look at, as far as examples go. Again, another question for the class. Try to do this on your own. Pause the video. The question says, you're standing on the edge of a small merry-go-round with a radius of 1.05 meters. Your friend spins you around until your speed is 6.75 meters per second. What is the period of your rotation in seconds when you're at the speed? What is the frequency of your rotation in hertz? And then let's also get the frequency of your rotation in units of RPM. So again, just practice making calculations of period and frequency. So let's go over to the board and work this one out. 
And how about we start with the period? Start with the period. Remember, the whole idea behind period is we can use the idea of speed equaling a distance over a time. And if we want that time to be one period, we're going to have to set the distance to a circumference, one full lap around the circle. So V is equal to 2 pi r divided by capital T. And the goal of what we're doing here is to find capital T, the period. So you can solve for the period T by multiplying through by T on both sides, and then dividing out V on both sides, which gives you T is equal to 2 pi r divided by V. And at this point, we know the radius and the speed at which you're moving, so we can go ahead and calculate the period directly. So the radius is 1.05 meters. The speed at which you're moving here is 6.75 meters per second. And if we look at the units here, what's happening is meters cancel out. Seconds goes to the top, so we have an amount of time measured in seconds. And that amount of time is this. So if you do the calculation, you'll get 0 0.9773 seconds. But in this case, we'll want to keep three significant figures because that's what's going into our calculation, three sig figs here as well as here, which will give us 0 0.9 nine seven seven seconds can you still see this down here okay just check okay so that's the period now as far as frequency goes this is not too bad because once we have the period just remember that frequency is one over the period one over t and here's how you want to think about this it takes how many seconds to make one full revolution that's the period we just calculated 0 0.9773 seconds. And if you like, you can just think about what's on top as one revolution. Right? There's one revolution in 0 0.9773 seconds. That's the idea. So when you make this calculation, here's what you get. Um, this is going to come out to 1.023 revolutions per second. But what we call this is a hertz. The unit here of revolutions per second is equivalent to hertz. So when we round off to three sig figs at 1.02, we can also write this as 1.02 hertz. Those are equivalent. So the last thing to do here is calculate this quantity in units of RPM. So let's work that out real quick. The quantity I'm starting with, frequency, is 1.023 revolutions per second. And what we want to do is convert that to revolutions per minute. So this is a pretty simple unit conversion. There are 60 seconds in every one minute. Cancel out seconds. Now we have revolutions per minute. And this comes out to 61.38 revolutions per minute. Rounding off to the right number of sig figs, we write this as 61.4 RPM. 61.4 RPM. Okay? So hopefully now you have some sense of how to calculate a period and a frequency. Um, it's not too bad. Just remember these formulas. All right, so let's do one more example here. In this next example, what we're going to do is calculate the frequency of the Earth's rotation on its axis in units of hertz. So again, hertz is revolutions per second. It takes a hell of a lot longer than a second for the Earth to rotate on its axis. So you can imagine this is going to be a really small number, because we don't really make even one revolution every second. It's much less than that. And what we're going to do is follow up with that with a calculation of the frequency of Earth's orbit around the sun in the same units. Okay? So that's what we'll do. Let's work it out on the board. So, to erase all of this, we have two separate problems here. 
and one of them has to do with the Earth rotating on its axis. So this is the Earth. It spins on its axis. And what we know about this motion is the period. Okay? How long does it take for the Earth to spin on its axis? That's one day. That's the definition of a day. The amount of time it takes the Earth to spin on its axis. So here, if we want the frequency then, let's just do it this way. The frequency is, again, how many revolutions you make per unit time. Well, we make one revolution per one day if we're talking about the rotation of the Earth. So let's just write rotation here, keep that straight from the follow-up question. All we're really doing here is another unit conversion of the time. We're trying to take revolutions per day and convert that to revolutions per second, which is hertz. Okay. So here, in one day, let's run through this real fast, we have 24 hours. And in every hour, we have 60 minutes. And in every minute, we have 60 seconds. Let's do the unit cancellation. Days, hours, minutes, what are we left with? Revolutions per second. How many? It's a small number, because we're basically taking one and dividing by a bunch of stuff. Turns out to be 1.16, 10, is it the minus five? Yes, minus five revolutions per second, which is the same as Hertz. So you could write that either way, unit-wise. Okay, let's think about the Earth's orbit. So the Earth not only spins on its axis, but it orbits around the Sun in a circular path, more or less. It's not exactly a circle, but let's just say it is for now. Here's the Sun. Here's the Earth. How long does it take for the Earth to go in one full circle around the Sun? Well, that period is exactly equal to one year. That is more or less the definition of what a year is. So let's do the calculation here. The frequency is equal to, we've got one revolution in one year. Okay, so we have a big unit conversion to do. In every one year, we have 365 days. It's actually not exactly right because of leap year, but let's ignore that. And then the rest of the unit conversion is exactly what we had before. Where we go from days to hours to minutes to seconds. Okay? So let's run through that real quick. One day, 24 hours, one hour, 60 minutes, and then one minute, 60 seconds. Let's cancel out everything we can. Days, hours, minutes, and again, we're left with revolutions per second, okay? But now we get an even smaller number, because this happens even slower. 3.17 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, revolutions per second. Again, you can also write this as hertz, okay? So I think that's enough practice just calculating frequency and period. Hopefully you see how this works by now. And what we're going to do is move on to something else dealing with circular motion. And I'm going to start this off with a question for the class. Okay? This says an object moves in a circular path at a constant speed. The net force acting on the object is A equal to zero or B not equal to zero. So think about it. Is the force going to be equal to zero or not equal to zero? Uh, try to work it out, and pause the video, see what you think. Okay, so now that you've come back, let's talk about the answer to this. Of course the answer is not equal to zero. When you have an object moving in a circular path, okay, even if it's at a constant speed, it is accelerating. Anything that is accelerating, if we think about Newton's second law, has a net force acting on it. Let's just write down Newton's second law, so you can be... Uh, clear about this, the net force acting on any object is equal to mass of the object times the acceleration. If we have non-zero acceleration, 
automatically implies that the net force is not equal to zero. So that's where we're going next with this. We have objects moving in uniform circular motion. Again, circular path at a constant speed. There is going to be a net force acting on that object. Let's figure out how to deal with that in the context of Newton's second law. Okay? So, back to the slide. Now what we're dealing with, if you think of this as the dynamics of uniform circular motion. Before, we were just talking about kinematics. So how does acceleration relate to speed and radius and so on? Now we're going to get into dynamics, which deals with the forces that are involved in this. Okay? So again, on the slide here is just Newton's second law. The net force is equal to mass times acceleration. If you remember that mass is just a scalar quantity, and it's always positive, masses don't go negative, what we have here is an acceleration and a net force, which are just related by some scalar quantity m. Whenever that's the case, you're going to have these two vectors pointing in the same direction. Because remember, if I multiply a vector, a, by a positive scalar m, I'm going to get something over here, my net force, that's just pointing in the same exact direction as my a vector. Okay, so just remember that. If my acceleration is in a certain direction, my net force is in the exact same direction. That's what Newton's law implies. Well, if we have an object in uniform circular motion, we already know what the acceleration is. It's pointing in. It's called centripetal acceleration, pointing in towards the center of the circle. This implies that net force acting on our object is also pointing in towards the center of the circle. Okay? So we have a net force going in towards the center. That's really important to remember. Sometimes we call that centripetal force, just like we call this centripetal acceleration, going inwards. Okay, so by now, we're used to taking Newton's second law and applying it to a particular direction, like the x direction or the y direction. We're really going to do the same exact thing here. We're going to apply Newton's second law to a particular direction of motion. But in this case, we're going to choose what's called the radial direction. So let me explain what the radial direction is. Well, in the circle, if we draw a line from the center going straight out, we call that a radius. So think in terms of a direction that goes in or out of the circle for the radial direction. And like any other axis that we draw to keep track of motion, we have a positive and a negative direction for r. Okay? So the convention that we're going to use in this class is, okay, we're in the positive radial direction for any force that's going in towards the center of the circle. And we're in the negative radial direction for any force that's going out, away from the center of the circle. That's how we deal with this. So if we apply Newton's second law to the radial direction, it's the net force in the r direction equals m times acceleration in the r direction. But we already know what the acceleration in the r direction is. It's given by v squared divided by r. That's the formula we derived at the beginning. So this is what we'll use for the dynamics of circular motion. Okay, the net force in the radial direction is m times v squared divided by r. Okay. So now that we have all this under our belts, let's do an example problem and then a follow-up. And then we'll wrap up this lecture after that. We have a 1.75 kilogram puck moving in a circular path on a frictionless and flat surface. The puck is tied to a string, which is attached to a post. The length of the connecting string segment is 75 centimeters, and the puck rotates with a frequency of 32.5 RPM. Okay? What we're going to do here is find the tension in the string in units of newtons. So what you see here in the picture is a top-down view. This is the post that the string is attached to. This is the puck that the string is attached to on the other side. And this is the ice, which has very little friction. We can ignore the friction shown in blue. So what's happening is this puck is just spinning around in a circle at 32.5 RPM. And the whole reason it can do that is the string is holding it there, keeping it from moving anywhere else but in this circular path. So what we're going to do is figure out what the tension in the string is. Okay? So let's work this one out on the board over here. It's 
So the very first thing we're going to do is draw a free body diagram of the puck. Okay, that's the first thing we'll do. And the picture on the slide was showing this motion of the puck looking from the top down. So you're looking down at the table. I want us to take a slightly different perspective and look at the puck from the side. So you're looking at it from the side uh, as opposed to from the top down. And here is the puck. Okay, so just to be clear, let's draw our axes. This is the y direction pointing straight up. And this is the radial direction. This points towards the center of the circle that the puck is moving. So if you'd like, you can imagine the puck is going into the board, then around, and back out, and back into the board like this, because we're looking at it from the side. Okay? So we're looking at the circle um, edge on. And again, what I want to do here is draw all the different forces acting on the puck. So if this is the string segment connecting the puck right here, there's going to be some tension in that string which is pulling on the puck. And so let's call that force T for tension. Okay, now this direction is down, so of course there's going to be a force of gravity acting in that direction. But at the same time, the surface that the puck rests on is pushing up with a normal force, and we call that N. And that's really all that's going on, because there's no friction here. Okay, so we have a normal force, we have a weight, and we have tension. So it's really important to see that the normal force and the weight act in the y direction, whereas the tension acts in the r direction, right? This is actually going in towards the center of the circle. So if we apply F equals ma to the y direction, this is what it will tell us. You have n going up, so that gets a positive sign. You have w going down, which gets a negative sign. And for a y, that represents acceleration up or down in the vertical direction. Well, that's just zero in this case, because there is no motion in that direction. And what we have is the normal force just equals the weight. So not super interesting as it turns out. OK, so the next thing we need to do is apply F equals MA to the radial direction. So the net force in the radial direction is the mass of the puck times the acceleration of the puck in the radial direction. So at this point, I want you to remember the sign convention for the radial direction. If a force is pointing in towards the center of the circle, that's positive. And if it's pointing out, away from the center, that's negative. So what we're going to do, since the tension force is pointing in, is give that a positive sign. And on the other side of the equation, we have m times acceleration in the radial direction which is V squared divided by R. Since the tension is the only force acting in this direction, that's all we have as far as the net force goes. Okay, so all I need to do now to find the tension is just plug in the mass, the speed of the puck, and the radius of the circle that it's moving in. There's only one slight issue with this. We don't have the speed of the puck. Instead, what we have is the frequency that the puck is rotating with. So, Let's do a little bit of a side calculation to get the speed. Okay, so what we know is that the frequency of the rotation of the puck in this circle is 32.5, and the units are RPM, which means revolutions per minute. So real quick, I'm going to convert this to revolutions per second, because I know eventually I want our speed to be in meters per second, so Let's get away from minutes into seconds, because in every one minute we have how many? 60 seconds. So it's just a matter of dividing by 60, canceling out the units of minutes. Our frequency, if you do the calculation, is 0. Point, uh, let me say that again. 5417. Revolutions per second. OK. What can we do next with this? Well, we can calculate the period. How long does it take the puck to move in a circle one time? Remember, that's just 1 divided by the frequency. And so what we're going to do is 
take 1 divided by 0 0.5417. And actually, guys, we should be keeping 3 sig figs here. And what this gives you is 1.846, and the units are seconds. So that tells you the puck moves in one full circle in a time of 1.846 seconds, and again, I'm keeping three sig figs down there. So why does the period matter to get me the speed? Well, it's because the speed we can always think of as distance over time. which gives us v is equal to 2 pi r. That's the distance we travel in one full circle. The circumference is 2 pi r. And then the time is one period. That's how long it takes to go in a circle. So we're going to plug in 2 pi times our radius. And our radius in this case was 75 centimeters, or 0 0.750 meters. That's the unit we want. Divide by the period, which is 1.846 seconds. And now we have a speed that the puck is moving at. And what we get is 2.553 meters per second. So that's the speed of the puck in meters per second. OK, so that was our side calculation to get the speed. The next thing we're going to do is just plug it straight in here to get the tension. Now we're going to get the tension in the string. T is equal to the mass of the puck. So let's get the mass, 1.75 kilograms. Okay. V squared is on top, so we'll take the speed we just found, 2.553 meters per second, and we're going to square that. And then we're going to divide by the radius, which is 0. 750 meters. Okay? When we make this calculation, we get our final answer, which is 15.2. We think about the units here for a second. We have kilograms. On top, when we square the speed, we're going to get meters squared, but that's going to cancel out with one factor of meters on the bottom. So we'll just have meters on top. When we, square, uh, when we square the seconds, we're going to have seconds squared on the bottom. We should recognize that that's a newton. Okay? So what we say is the tension is 15.2 newtons of force. That is the final answer right there. Okay. So we're going to do one follow-up question that's purely conceptual, um, and then we'll wrap up this video lecture. And here it is. Follow-up question. So this is a question for the class. This is the puck from the previous problem. And again, in this diagram, we're looking at it from the top down. So it's a string connecting the puck to a post. The puck is moving in a circle like this. Okay. But this time, I want you to imagine that the string that's holding the puck there breaks. Okay. And at the moment the string breaks, it's right over here. Okay. So it's on the right side of the circle. The question asks, which of these arrows, A, B, C, and D, represents the direction the puck is going to move in after the string breaks? So is it going to move like this, as shown in A? Is it going to move straight up like this in B? Is it going to move up and to the right like in C? Or is it going to move straight to the right like in D? So take a minute, pause the video, think about what your answer is, then we'll go through it. Okay. So this is a conceptual question, so we'll just real quickly run through the answer. So the answer, of course, is going to be B. That is how the object moves after the string breaks. And if you want to understand why that is, you're going to have to think about Newton's first law of motion. Okay? So if the string is not broken and there's tension holding the puck here in place, the puck is going to move in a circle okay? because there's a net force pulling it towards the center. That keeps it moving in a circle. Okay? As soon as the string breaks, that tension is gone. So now that there's actually no force there that's going in towards the center that keeps it moving in a circle. So, in fact, we have zero net force acting on the puck the moment the string breaks. 
because there's no other force uh, acting in this plane. So how do things move in the absence of any kind of net force when there's no net force? That's what Newton's first law is all about. Newton's first law says that an object that has no net force or no unbalanced forces acting on it is going to move in a straight line with constant velocity. Okay? And at the moment the string breaks, our object is moving straight up. Okay? Tangent to the path that you see here. The point is, if the string breaks, it's going to continue moving in that path at a constant velocity because there's no net force acting on it. So it's actually B that's showing you what that path is most accurately. When the string breaks, this is how it moves. All right, so that's going to be it for today. Um, that's the first video lecture. It's going to be like this from here on out. And um, again, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next one.